All right, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today for the last in our wildfire effects on wildlife webinar series. This is a partnership between uh, the Northern Rockies Fire Science Network and the Association for Fire Ecology. My name's Corey Davis and I work with the Northern Rockies Fire Science Network. And uh, I'll just go run through some quick logistics here and then I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Gavin Jones. So first of all, uh, this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to the Northern Rockies YouTube channel. And if you have questions today, which I hope you do, especially for the panel, um, go ahead and put those questions in the chat window. The closed captions are also available. Just use the live transcript button that should be on your menu. We also have Wildlife Society and Society of American Foresters continuing education credits available. Uh, you'll need to submit a claim for those. I will send in the attendee lists. And then finally, at the very end, when you log out, uh, a survey should pop up, uh, very brief, five or six questions. Um, and I really appreciate if you would fill that out for us. So uh, I just want to say a few words here about the Fire Science Exchange Network. I can get it to go to the next slide. There we go. Um, so there are 15 exchanges across the country, and this is part of the Joint Fire Science Program. And what we do is we create space for fire scientists and fire managers to discuss their work. And uh, we have a variety of projects uh, or products, I should say, including research briefs and science reviews, videos. If you go to our website, uh, and in, we also have a very extensive fire science research publication database. And then we also host a lot of events. So such as this webinar, we do field trips, workshops. So uh, please get involved in your local fire science exchange. And with that, I will hand it over to Gavin for a brief introduction before he goes into a, uh, a presentation of his own. And then we'll finish up with a panel discussion. All right, go ahead, Gavin. All right, great. Thank you, Corey. And uh, yeah, I'm going to give a little introduction to sort of some of the context for why we're putting this, this special um, webinar series on. So uh, a couple of years ago at the Wildlife Society Conference, some colleagues and I hosted a symposium on the wildfire and prescribed fire effects on wildlife. It was a really fun symposium. Uh, and we thought it would be nice to collect some of the topics into a special collection in the journal Fire Ecology. And so over the past couple of years, we've been putting this uh, work together. Um, and uh, we now have a special collection uh, up at this web address here, the URL. Uh, we've got 11 papers in this special collection and counting a few more we expect to come in before we close it out. Um, but it's been a really fun collection to put together with my colleagues, uh, Bryce Hanbury, Katie uh, Greenberg and Angela White. And, uh, we hope that you take the time to go check it out. And I'm gonna be sort of synthesizing or covering some of the um, topics that are covered in the special collection today. So can you go to the next slide, Corey? There we go. Uh, so this is, this is a, you know, we all like looking at cute and cuddly critters and these are some of the cute and cuddly critters uh, that are covered in the special issue in some way or another uh, throughout the, the various publications that, that are in the collection. So, um, you know, everything ranging from brown bears to pine woods tree frogs to spotted owls to sage grouse to fruit bats. So all sorts of really interesting stuff going on in this issue um, and really covers a broad range of the types of studies and the types of animals that are influenced by uh, fires in fire prone ecosystems. So go ahead, next slide, Corey. There we go. Must be a little delay going on here. So thanks for bearing with us. Uh, so the last two weeks have been really lovely. We've heard from some awesome scientists doing awesome fire research. Uh, everything from 
uh, spotted owls to uh, uh, bird communities to bats and fire, sage grouse impacts, etc. Um, been a really fun couple of weeks. And this week, I'm going to close us out with a little bit of a synthesis of what we've heard the past few weeks and also what, what else is in the special issue, uh, as well as talk. I'm going to be discussing some broader issues uh, that we should be thinking about. I think we should be thinking about with respect to how to study um, the effects of wildfire on wildlife and some of the conservation issues that come along with that. And following my talk, uh, we're also gonna be having a panel discussion with several uh, wildfire and uh, wildlife experts. So this is the time to ask your burning questions to a group of fire experts and wildlife experts. So as I'm uh, going through this talk today, uh, you know, feel free to jot down some questions if you have um, questions you'd like to pose to the panel. I will definitely be entertaining those. And I think you'll be entering those into the chat and uh, Corey uh, will be documenting those and we'll be able to ask those to the panel today, um, assuming that we'll, we'll have time to cover most questions. So uh, with that, I am going to transition into my own talk. And I think originally I was gonna have uh, somebody uh, doing that section introducing my talk. So I'm going to just do it myself. <laughs> so let me pull up. There we go. Uh, can I get confirmation, maybe Corey or someone else that you can see my screen? Looks good, Gavin. Okay, great. Okay, so, and let me hide this little thing that you probably can't see, hide the floating meeting controls. There we go. So today I'm gonna be doing, uh, I'm gonna be starting out our session uh, with a synthesis of wildlife and fire issues that have been covered by uh, the talks we've heard the past couple of weeks, as well as those covered in uh, a broader range of papers in the special collection in fire ecology, uh, and also talking a little bit more about um, some issues that maybe go beyond what we covered in, in that issue. <clears throat> All right, and you do see my slide advancing, correct? I'll assume so, unless I hear otherwise. Okay. So yeah, it looks like we, it. great, thank you. So when we think about the way that wildfire impacts wildlife, there's a whole range of types of questions that can be asked or angles that we can look at thinking about these effects. One is the effect of wildfire on habitat, the direct effects to habitat. We can also think about how fire potentially influences habitat and therefore influences the connectivity of habitat throughout space and time. We can look at the direct effects of fire to species in terms of the effects on population size or abundance, uh, kind of more direct effects to wildlife. We can also look more broadly at the effects of wildfire on communities of animals, either within the same taxonomic group or across taxa. Uh, another really important angle that many of the papers in the special collection considered were the effects of management on wild, uh, wildlife communities and more specifically how fire management, either pre or post fire management uh, is influencing wildlife communities as well. In addition to these direct approaches or empirical approaches investigating the effects of wildfire on wildlife, uh, either populations or communities or habitat, we also saw in our special collection a couple of syntheses, sort of taking all the pieces that have been put out there in the literature and trying to come up with a game plan for future research and put those, those uh, building blocks of knowledge together to try and, and further our understanding. And so these are the range of approaches that we saw in our special collection. And I'm gonna go through and highlight some of those now because I really do think that they cover uh, this broad range of approaches. And so, so it, it's a nice representation of the types of, of uh, techniques people use to study these, these effects of fire on, on wildlife. So we're going to start out by looking at the effects of fire on habitat directly. A couple of papers in the special issue I want to highlight. The first one is by Tara Durbera. Uh, and this paper I thought was really fascinating. It looked at the, the long-term recovery of habitat for Mexican spotted owls in the Lincoln National Forest. And so uh, one of the findings in this paper is showing, so this, is the, this plot is showing the density of large trees. And this uh, purple line here is showing sort of the minimum conditions for, uh, you know, that are considered to be habitat for Mexican spotted owls. And across all these different decades, 
uh, going, you know, from the 2010s when fires burned in the 2010s to the 2000s and the 60s and 20s, um, Durbara and her colleagues showed that uh, in some cases, in places that have burned at high severity, these red box plots here can take up to 100 years to see recovery of conditions in terms of large tree uh, recruitment into the habitat category for Mexican spotted owls. Uh, lower severity fire uh, re recovered more quickly in terms of getting into that large tree um, uh, category considered to be Mexican spotted owl habitat. This is a really nice long-term look at how uh, wildlife habitat recovers in response to wildfire. Another approach that Damon Lesmeister used, and he spoke on the, in the first week of our session, uh, is looking at um, how uh, different forest types, such as interior or edge forest or non-nesting forest for northern spotted owls, um, how those are likely to burn at different severities. So this, this is one of those figures that Damon shared uh, during his talk, showing if you look at these uh, green squares here, you can see uh, that uh, interior forest, so sort of the the interior portions of the forest, not the edges or anything, but sort of the, the core of, of forest uh, habitat for Mexicans or for Northern spotted owls is more likely to burn at low severity than it is to burn at high severity and moderate severity. So these interior forests potentially have this buffering effect uh, that may protect them from uh, uh, burning at high severity from those microclimate conditions. This is a really neat look um, at how fire uh, it may interact with, with uh, northern spotted owl habitat. Another approach is looking at connectivity. So how fire influences the connectivity of, of habitat. This is a paper that was also in the special issue by Rasul Kosravi. And uh, this was a, a neat paper looking at brown bear connectivity in Iran. And the approach that Kosravi and colleagues took was looking at uh, the distribution of, of brown bear uh, critical habitat, the potential uh, corridors that connected those habitats in terms of gene flow and, um, and population exchange, and uh, the, the risk that forest fires may pose to the connectivity of those sort of critical habitat cores. And so uh, this, is, this is a pretty novel approach within the special issue that was, uh, I thought, a unique look at the, at the risk that forest fires may pose to connectivity. Another approach is looking at the direct effects of wildfire on species. Uh, Biazzo and Quintana Asensio in the special issue looked at how prescribed fires influenced uh, the abundance of pine woods tree frogs in the southeastern US. And this is one of their findings showing that frog abundance uh, increased uh, during this post-fire window as compared to pre-fire uh, before these prescribed fires. And so uh, again, looking at those direct effects using a really neat field experiment that you're shown on the left with these um, different sort of PVC tubes placed at different heights and looking at the, the effect of uh, uh, prescribed burning and time since burn on, on uh, the, this tree frog abundance. So looking at direct effects here, another approach uh, that we heard about in the first week uh, by uh, uh, Ian Dudley and his colleagues. And we heard from Peter Coates, uh, one of the, the co-authors in this paper in the first week, showing that, that uh, uh, burned areas um, tend to result in lower uh, population growth rates for sage grouse compared to unburned areas. So uh, again, looking at those direct effects on population vital rates uh, of wildfire. We had some papers also look at the effects, uh, this direct effect of wildfire on uh, wildlife communities. So Koresh Latif and his colleagues showed among other things, this potential benefit of prescribed fire on species richness. Uh, although, you know, a lot of variation uh, uh, among sites, but, but this general uh, benefit of prescribed fire, which, you know, is useful information for managers. This is done up in uh, uh, Northwest Idaho. Another uh, piece looking at community effects of wildfire, um, Jorge et al. showing these really variable effects of uh, mean fire return interval on bat uh, activity. So, and looking across all these species, uh, sort of trying to understand the community level uh, effects in these southeastern uh, longleaf pine forests. Uh, another approach looking at the effects of post fire management on wildlife communities. Alyssa Fogg, who we heard from last week, talked about the effects of salvage logging. Uh, post-fire salvage logging on bird communities in the Sierra Nevada, showing a pretty wide range of uh, individual species responses uh, to post-fire activity, uh, uh, which again is, is sort of a unique angle that we saw in the special issue. 
And then finally, we saw a couple of syntheses. So looking uh, broadly across literature and trying to come up with research directions, having synthesized what's out there. And we heard from Susan Loeb the first week about uh, the work that she and Rachel Blakey did on bats and fire, this global review. And one of the neat outcomes from their work was sort of synthesizing this, uh, the variation across space and time and how bats and bat communities respond to wildfire. And they laid out uh, some research directions in their, in their paper as well. And then Greg Albury, who we heard from last week, uh, discussed the influence of wildfire on disease transmission and potentially laying out some research directions uh, in that area. So this is just a sampling of the work that is featured in the special issue. But the point is that uh, it, it's not necessarily about those specific papers, but it's about the you know, covering this range of approaches that we can take when we're thinking about how wildfire impacts wildlife um, and recognizing that each of these approaches provide unique information that together can be synthesized to understand uh, some of these broader patterns across populations and communities and how that might vary across different systems. So again, just one last plug for that special issue. Go and, go and check it out um, and, and look at some of these papers in more depth if any of those little vignettes interested you. But what I want to spend the rest of the time on today is uh, going beyond uh, those specific examples and thinking about conservation and evolution of wildlife in the Pyrocene or this new epoch of, uh, of increased fire activity, uh, building on, on some of those themes that, we, that I just discussed a few moments ago. And first, I want to take us on a little bit of a tour around some different ecosystems across the globe and how we have seen wildfire activity uh, uh, studied and its potential effects on wildlife. And so in 2019 and 2020, I'll go back to the previous slide. This uh, image here is actually from the, uh, the uh, I think it was the New Year's Eve fires in New South Wales uh, in, in 2019 going into the year 2020. Um, when Australia saw just an, an extraordinary uh, uh, blow up in, in their bushfire activity. And this, uh, these effect, the effects of these wildfires has been really heavily studied over the past couple of years. And uh, some of that work is cited down here in the bottom of this slide. Uh, but this here shows you the distribution of those 2019, 2020 Australian bushfires, mostly across the southeastern portion of the continent. Um, but this work, uh, uh, that I, I believe this, th these figures I'm summarizing here are from the Collins paper that's cited on the bottom, um, but uh, just showing the quite unusual uh, and uh, high level of fire activity in 2019 and 2020. So showing just the, you know, a lot of area was burnt in, in 20, uh, 19, 2020 here, and uh, the number of, of uh, large fire events or mega fires was really significantly uh, larger than has been seen over the past several decades in the continent. So at least in our recent uh, history and what we've seen over the past several decades of research, this is a pretty uh, extraordinary occasion. And I'm gonna zoom in here and just show you some examples of species that have experienced different kinds of fire effects depending on their distribution. So a rock skink, for example, has had a huge portion of its range impacted by these 2019-2020 fires. yellow belly glider similarly. Um, and we've got uh, you know, species in, in the Southeastern Australia who are you know, range limited and who have large ranges and uh, everything in between that have been impacted by these fires. And Michelle Ward and her colleagues showed that there has uh, a number of species, at least 41, um, have uh, species that were not considered to be threatened in any way prior to these fires have now sort of crossed the threshold of habitat loss to the point where they need to be considered uh, for assessed or to be assessed as threatened uh, within uh, uh, Australia. And six species have crossed the line into uh, potentially being assessed for their endangered status. So the point here is that the effects of these 2019, 2020 wildfires, just one fire season has potentially put, you know, 47 uh, Australian species that were not previously thought to be threatened into that threatened or endangered category. And there's also species that were threatened or were endangered that have gone into uh, sort of higher classes uh, following these fires. In 2020, there was the Brazilian Pantanal fires as well, which were widespread and widely discussed. 
uh, in the scientific literature and many studies have followed up on, on those impacts to wildlife as well. One of those studies just highlighting here in terms of the jaw dropping effect uh, is that um, uh, this work by Tomas uh, estimated that 17 million vertebrates have, were directly killed by those 2020 uh, wildfires in the Brazilian Pantanal. So again, potential uh, really serious direct uh, effects to wildlife. And then of course, uh, over the similar period, 2020 and 2021, although uh, those years aren't necessarily unique, but much more wildfire activity was seen in those years in, in the Western US, particularly in California, Oregon, and Washington. Uh, and one of the big concerns in these systems, particularly the dry forest systems, is the potential lack of, of regeneration of forest habitat uh, for wildlife, which also of course has impacts for ecosystem services as well. So, uh, this all seems not so great. And I gave you, a, this is a little tour of maybe the dire uh, effects um, of, of wildfire on wildlife, but uh, not all animals die during fire. And in fact, most animals survive wildfire. This is a, uh, a graph from a paper by Chris Jolly uh, that came out in Global Change Biology a couple of years ago just showing a summary of the research on animal mortality during wildfire. And Jolly and his colleagues showed that on average, only about 3% of animals are directly killed during wildfire. And so despite all of those you know, really dire and concerning stats that I just showed you, it seems like uh, on, on average, uh, you have quite a low percentage of animals dying directly in fire. Now this depends a little bit on the fire severity. So whether we have mild or severe fires, uh, mortality goes up a little bit more in severe fires, but still, you know, we're not seeing every animal in a forest die uh, when a wildfire comes along. Now, why is this? Part of the reason is that animals are adapted to avoid uh, fires. They have fire avoidance behaviors. And Dale Nimmo and colleagues in Global Change Biology summarized some of these avoidance behaviors, including immediate evacuation. So this is sort of the Bambi effect, as I like to call it, um, when you have all the critters just running away from the fire when it comes along, this immediate evacuation behavior. You also have doubling back. Uh, this is a common technique that wildland firefighters use, you know, going back and doubling back into the black. It's actually you know, known to be safer once a fire burns through to go into places that have already burned, you know, they're not going to burn again. So chimps do this in, in some cases. Uh, you have delayed evacuation where animals wait for a fire line to cross and then they, they escape. So maybe getting down into a burrow for a short period of time. And then you also have shelter in place techniques where um, animals will uh, you know, go into, uh, in this case, and I'll talk about this a, a little more in a few slides, we'll go into torpor. This is the Antichinus. Um, and uh, uh, this uh, species will actually go into a physiological torpor uh, during fire events and, and get down underground in their burrows. So animals have all these fire avoidance behaviors which help them survive the direct effects of wildfire. And they don't only survive wildfire, but many animals experience benefits from wildfire. So here's some of those possible benefits of fire to animals that help them not only survive, but help them thrive in these post-fire environments. So everything from food resources uh, to uh, habitat alteration that may benefit animals, biotic interactions, fire can alter these things, including disease dynamics as Greg talked about last week. And fire can produce these mating cues for certain species, um, particularly for insects, which I'll talk more about in a moment. And I won't talk about each of these in detail. This is summarized in this nice paper by Huli Passas and Catherine Parr. Um, but uh, this just gives you a sense of the types of benefits that animals can experience uh, directly from wildfire. In addition, fire also generates this multi-scale variability in the landscape uh, across space, but also through time. And so this is just some examples of uh, the types of landscape or spatial variability uh, that wildfire can produce in ecosystems. And everything from these large scale patches of burned and unburned forests within these mosaics of green forest uh, to larger scale, uh, you know, fire killed areas to more of a medium scale, you know, panel C and D here showing smaller scale variation of fire, even fine scale variation uh, in which vegetation burns and what doesn't that can produce refuges for uh, certain animals. So fire generates a lot of variation and when we have more variation, we often have more uh, heterogeneity and habitat that species can occupy. 
And this has led uh, many scientists uh, to consider this uh, pyrodiversity biodiversity hypothesis or this idea that the greater uh, amount of variation we have in fire effects, the greater uh, richness we'll have in biodiversity because of several mechanisms outlined here. Number one is for individual species, uh, we, we may have habitat complementation where places that experience variation of fire effects. So maybe you know, a high severity versus low severity fire shown in these different you know, uh, colors of, of gray shading. Uh, you know, may generate the this variation in habitat conditions that can help an individual species uh, survive and thrive in these post-fire environments. You may have certain habitats, uh, variation in, in fire effects that can provide refuges for prey species to allow sort of predator-prey coexistence in these um, uh, variable landscapes. You can also have this sort of more classic habitat heterogeneity idea that different kinds of fire effects through space and time are gonna generate different niches for different species to occupy and therefore allow more different kinds of species to pack into um, a, a place that has greater uh, variation in fire effects. And a similar kind of uh, view can be looked at uh, through time in addition to space shown here on, on the right, this fire seasonality hypothesis. So the idea is that all of this variation produced by fire can actually support uh, uh, the assembly and the maintenance of biodiversity in landscapes. Uh, through space and time. Not only does fire variation or power diversity have these effects on sort of the current obser observed patterns of, of biodiversity, but it's been hypothesized that fire is really a driver of biodiversity and potentially even the rise of biodiversity in some systems. And so this is a really nice synthesis and biological reviews of this idea um, that I would, would encourage you to, to check out. Um, and <clears throat> it stands to reason, therefore, that animals will have adapted various traits uh, to respond to fire, but also to thrive in these post-fire environments. And so I'm just going to highlight here in these colored blocks several of the types of traits we might expect animals to uh, have uh, that uh, maybe evolved in these fire-prone environments, everything from behavioral traits to morphological to physiological traits uh, that they've actually evolved through evolutionary time. Uh, to cope uh, with fire, either um, the fire event itself or the post-fire survival and um, reproduction. And so again, this is a table from this paper by Passas and Parr that I really encourage you to check out. And here's just a couple of examples, uh, some of which were drawn from that table, uh, of traits that appear to be fire adapted in several uh, wildlife taxa. And so on the upper left, this is the Western fence lizard uh, with some dark coloration. And the hypothesis that's supported by some empirical literature is, is that you may have higher survival of these sort of darker morphs uh, in places that have recently burned, which would make sense because these animals can blend into those burned backdrops a little more than a lighter morph. And I'll talk more about this example in a moment. Uh, on the upper right, this is a Melanophila beetle, one of the classic examples of fire adaptations in animals. Uh, these beetles have infrared sensors on their uh, sides uh, that actually allow them to sense uh, and uh, navigate uh, in and around a fire front um, uh, uh, where, uh, you know, as the fire is burning through the forest, for example. Uh, and they use these fire fronts as meeting points for their reproductive behaviors. And so really fire is sort of this cue for reproductive activity in the beetle that allows them to navigate there and um, reproduce safely in these burning environments. On the bottom left, uh, some of the work that I've been involved in over the past couple of years has suggested that some of these larger vertebrates like California spotted owls uh, are adapted behaviorally to hunt in smaller patches of high severity uh, fire or standard placing fire that's consistent with their evolutionary environment of these smaller patches of high severity fire in, in dry forest ecosystems. And then on the, on the bottom right, again, this is just a photo of that species that was in the cartoon a couple of slides back in Antichinus. This is the genus Antichinus um, uh, <clears throat> that uh, goes into, actually goes into a, a physiological torpor uh, during, during fire events. So again, this is just some examples of the, you know, everything from behavioral to physiological to morphological adaptations that animals have uh, in these fire prone environments. And here's, here's just one example of how we might expect uh, these changes, these evolutionary changes to occur uh, mechanistically in some of these animal species. So this is just an example of what's called directional selection. 
So the idea that a changing environment may be shifting the dominant phenotypes uh, in uh, a system. And so uh, what I'm showing you here is a little cartoon of made up uh, phenotypes in a population. So here they are across space and here's just a summary of their, of their distribution. And this is a scenario where we may be having a changing environment from an inactive fire regime to a more active fire regime, which you know may be happening in some of our systems where we've had a lot of fire suppression over the past uh, you know, 100 years or so. And so in a situation like this, we may expect that, um, that there's a certain phenotype that perhaps in this case, in this example is low in abundance because uh, fire activity has been low, um, but that, that phenotype may be ad advantageous in a burned environment or a fire, you know, more active fire environment. So this, the, fe the fitness of this phenotype may be greater when fires come along. We may expect shifts in the dominance of this phenotype to occur in a population post-fire Again, if, if we're going to if we're sort of increasing fire activity through time. And one example of, of this is in, in some pygmy grasshoppers, this has been shown uh, that these darker morphs, very similar to the Western fence lizard that I discussed earlier, these darker morphs have higher survival rates in post-fire environments. Uh, we may expect these kinds of morphological uh, shifts, uh, you know, particularly coloration in insects, for example. Um, to occur in uh, uh, changing fire environments such as this. You could have the opposite occur too, going from an active fire regime to a fire excluded or fire suppressed regime where we, we go into more fire dormancy. Uh, you could have, you know, taking the same distribution of phenotypes over here and beginning on this timeline, you could have an active fire regime where we remove fires. And when we remove fires, perhaps that phenotype that gave advantage in fire prone environments is less advantageous. We may see a shift in phenotype uh, going back, uh, fluctuating to the, to the other uh, you know, sort of fire um, dormant phenotype. And we may see sort of a shift in coloration. So this is just one example where we may see uh, a shift in coloration and phenotype uh, because of changing fire activity. And as we go from periods of activity to dormancy within fire regimes, we could see fluctuating selection where the dominant mechanism switches back and forth between these two. And so there's many other types of selection we might see. Uh, there's uh, uh, ways that gene flow and genetic connectivity uh, and genetic drift may be also in influenced by uh, fire activity and changing fire regimes. But this is just one, uh, what I hope is a clear example of how we might expect fire to drive animal evolution. And so I'm gonna wrap up my portion here, but I just wanna summarize uh, some of the things that I've been discussing. And the, the first is that fire regimes are changing rapidly. And as was shown by some of these the papers early on in, in uh, this presentation, uh, fire regimes may be threatening uh, the extinction of some species, or at the very least, um, uh, making us look more closely at the risk that fires might pose to them. Uh, one good example of that was, again, the, the work done in Australia and in the Brazilian Pantanal, really vast mortality events um, driven by wildfire that could really threaten some of these more range-limited species. At the same time, however, animals are adapted to survive fire. And so this raises the question of, uh, you know, the ability of animals to evolve in, in the face of uh, changing fire regimes. Uh, is there sufficient evolutionary potential uh, for rapid adaptation in, in uh, wild animals? And so some of the key questions that I think remain uh, following my talk here, which we are free to discuss or, or not, and I don't necessarily have answers for these, uh, is first, what conservation interventions can further support animal survival in the pyrocene? Can we do anything? And if so, what? And what kind of impact will it have? And then number two, can evolution keep pace with fire regime changes? Or are things happening too quickly? We know that evolution can happen rapidly when we have strong selective pressures. And the question is whether we have enough potential uh, for that to happen in wild populations. So I hope some of these ideas were stimulating and, and sort of got you thinking a little bit. Um, and I think at this point, we can take some questions for a few moments before we transition into our panel discussion, if anyone has any specific questions on this stuff. I'm gonna attempt to relocate my own face here. <laughs> um, and let's see. Maybe I will stop sharing for the moment.
And there may be questions in the chat and maybe I'll ask for some help from Corey if there are those questions in the chat um, to help read those off. Corey, are you there? Yes. OK, great. Sorry about that. Uh, oh, no, all good. All right, yeah, something locked up on my end. So I hope we're going all right. Yep, we're good now. So any questions on that? I'll ask a question if no one's, no one's jumping in here. So, Gavin, I just want to turn that back on you. Do you, do you think that uh, the current fire regime changes are going too rapidly for evolution? Like, what are your thoughts on that since you've been writing about this? Well, I'll first tell you I'm not an evolutionary biologist. I'm just sort of pretending to be one for a little while because I think it's an interesting topic. But um, myself and some colleagues have put together sort of a synthesis of the evidence on this topic it's in review right now. And um, I think that the reality is, is evolution is happening right now in response to changing wildfire regime. We just don't fully understand what it looks like and the degree to which different kinds of animals and different systems are able to evolve. Um, evolution being treated broadly here, right? So any sort of change in allele frequencies or phenotypes in populations through time, that's evolution. So this is certainly happening um, there's differential survival, uh, you know, across a range of traits within a population. And that's going to lead to direct evolution. So the question is whether the surviving animals are going to have, you know, traits that are more beneficial that can be passed on uh, to survive these these wildfire events. So it really remains to be seen, and I don't uh, I don't know, but I think that a lot more work should be done on that on that particular topic. I think I find it really fascinating. All right. Um, now, Corey, would you help sort of facilitate some of the, the questions that are in the chat? There's kind of too many for me to have tracked. Yep. No, I've got them written down here. Um, Patrick has his hand raised right now. Uh, I'm going to allow him to ask a question. And he had one earlier. Oh, he put his hand down. So, uh, but he asked a question earlier. Uh, he said, in Utah, there's a growing sentiment that there should be systematic burning of conifer areas, which the proponents state the conifers will be replaced by aspen, which in turn will allow for greater stream and groundwater flow. Uh, again, the proponents suggest this burned conifers will provide significant waters to restore the Great Salt Lake. As a retired research biologist, I know the proponents are wrong, but does anyone have access or know of any research that's been done on this proposition. And uh, I know Bryce had uh, some thoughts about it, but I'm wondering if anybody else has any, uh, yeah, any resources they can share on that topic. Yeah, that's definitely something I should not wade into not being super familiar with it. So, um, but yeah, please drop any references that anyone has in the chat. That would be super grateful. Looks like there was a reference just placed in there. So, That was all the questions that I saw, although I was dropped for a few minutes, so I don't know if a couple other ones came in or not, but maybe maybe we can bring the other panelists on at this point. And yep, uh, that sounds great. Okay. <clears throat> okay, excellent. So I will kind of take over then from you, uh, Corey. So thank you for helping facilitate that. And yeah, if all the panelists could please turn on their, their webcams so we can see your smiling faces and make sure you didn't fall asleep during that uh, presentation I gave. Um, <laughs> right, so uh, thank you panelists for joining. And again, I just wanna put the invitation out to everybody who's joining this as a participant that please drop your questions for the panelists in the chat. Um, but what we're gonna start out with is um, me forcing these panelists to answer a couple of questions uh, that I want to hear them answer um, uh, about the effects of wildfire on wildlife. So I'm going to go ahead and, and pose these questions and 
Um, I want to first introduce our panelists before we do that. So um, we've got a nice range of expertise um, and specialty on this, this uh, panel. So first, I want to introduce Angela White. So Angela, will you just give a wave? Um, Angela is a research wildlife biologist with the U.S. Forest Service Pacific Southwest Research Station. We've got Jamie Sanderlin. Uh, Jamie is also a research wildlife biologist. She's with the Rocky Mountain Research Station uh, of, of the Forest Service. We've got Andrew Stillman. Andrew's a postdoctoral fellow at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. We've got Katie Greenberg, a research ecologist with the Southern Research Station of the Forest Service. And finally, uh, Zach Steele, who is a research biological scientist with the US Forest Service's Rocky Mountain Research Station up in Fort Collins, Colorado. So the first, um, the first question I wanna pose to this panel, uh, and anybody can jump in at this point uh, and answer initially, and then I may, I may ask individuals who I think would have interesting perspectives. The first question is, what is a misconception that you think scientists, managers, or the broader public have about the effects of fire on wildlife? Angela, you go first. Why don't you take a crack at that? Um, I would say a common misconception is that we have the answers. Expand. <laughs> um, I think even just in, I forget who posed the question or was talking anytime. I think too often our statements start out with, well, when this happens, this happens. And there's not really enough... Um, maybe including of the uncertainties that, you know, lead us to different situations. So everything becomes very black and white, like this causes this. That's like the language we use to be scientific <laughs> um, without actually really just saying we're not really sure and maybe going to the questions that might be maybe more important with where we're at right now is what do we do about that? Um, I guess that's all I have to say. We, we don't know. We're in a new era where we just can't know. You're comparing across continents, different fire regimes. Australia is kind of different. They don't, you know, they're they're a big island. You know, we're we're a continental. You know, we're a larger continent. So just, I think, pretending we know too much is a mistake. Yeah, uh, I want to ask Andrew. What, what do you think? What, what are some miscon? What's a misconception, or do you want to respond to Angela at all? Yeah, well, I'm. I think my comments on this might might actually uh, kind of build on Andrew's uh, just a little bit. And in that, when thinking about a public perspective, I think one of the misconceptions is that the the problems that we talk about in terms of fire and, and increasing mega fires, thinking about the the problem of fire being a new thing. And I think a lot of the public doesn't understand that fires happening in California is not new. Fires burning in Florida, that's also not new. This is, it's, it's new if we look at things from a historical baseline of 1980 or 1960, it's not new for thinking about the early 1800s or something like that. What's, what's really happening, kind of the, the novelty here is that we're turning up the dials in certain areas where fires might be getting larger, fires might be getting more intense, they might be happening more frequently or in some cases, um, there isn't necessarily a directional way that we're turning up the dials. Instead, things are just becoming more uncertain, and harder to predict. So I think that's a communication challenge for the broader public is, that, is saying that fires aren't new. Fire in itself is not the problem. The problem is that fires are changing in ways that we haven't perhaps seen them in our lifetimes and we need to do a lot of um, work to try to figure out what might happen in the future. I want to popcorn this around to everybody because I think this is a good question to hear from everybody. So, um, Katie, can you you mind answering that question next? What's what do you think is a misconception uh, that's, that scientists, managers, or the broader public have? Well, I think uh, to build on what Andrew was saying, uh, the other problem with perception right now is that not only have fire regimes changed, but also humans have spread into the environments that before it probably didn't matter nearly as much. And now it's becoming a horror because their property and lives are 
much more at risk. And um, I think also, you know, sentiment has a whole lot to do with how fire is perceived. So, you know, if you're not necessarily educated on how fire can maintain important habitat types or how it's important to certain species or endangered species, you might think about the direct effect more than anything else. Oh, ban you know, the deer was killed or whatever, which is reasonable. Um, but I think those, those things all enter into our perceptions of fire today for the public. One, one other thing is um, I think that a lot of managers might have misconceptions because um, they may not fully, un they may fully understand their own system where they're working, depending on who you're talking about, of course. But there are many, many kinds of ecosystems, you know, and even within the Southeast, there's the coastal plain, the Piedmont, the mountains. And fire isn't the same thing everywhere you go. The, the regimes aren't the same. They shouldn't be the same. Uh, the, the mantras aren't the same about get fire on the ground. It's so great, you know, meaning that I learned that it's good. So therefore it's good everywhere all the time at the same frequencies. And I think a lot of managers don't necessarily even understand that. Great, thank you, Katie. Jamie, I wanna throw that question over to you. What do you think? Great, right. so I'd say one of the misconceptions that I've encountered with the general public is that all wildfires will lead to all wildlife species not occurring after the fire. And one thing that we've used to combat that misconception was actually partnering with a local non NGO um, group and did some citizen science with that group to sample bird communities within a fire perimeter. And they were just amazed to see that a fire had all that range of variability from really hot spots to sp spaces on the landscape that didn't see barely any fire. So yeah, that's that's one thing that we've done to to tackle you know, a potential misconception. Zach, last but not least, what's what's a misconception that you've seen about fire and wildlife? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know if I have too much novel to add to this. Some good points already, but uh, I guess just uh, building on what Jamie was saying, and I apologize if you can hear the lawnmower or whatever is going on outside, but you know what happens. Um, but uh, yeah, I feel like what's often presented to the public and, and what even some folks that, that understand fire ecology pretty well is it's often binned into it. Fire is all good or fire is all bad. And the public often goes to the bad part because you know we, we see homes burning down and all that. Um, but obviously there's a lot of nuance there if you watch the presentations in this session and listen to people. So it's difficult to convey that nuance, especially given that we don't have all the answers, like Angela said. Um, so how do we uh, kind of convey that uncertainty and, and what we do understand productively um, with all the, the variation and fire regimes and how wildlife responds to it and how to do that to that well is, is a challenge, especially when you sometimes have some loud voices that are advocating good or bad, um, whether intentionally or not. Great. Uh, if anyone in the audience has any Thing that they'd like to communicate about misconceptions, uh, feel free to drop that in the chat as well. But I want to, I want to go on to another question to the panel, um, which I think is a natural outflow from this question here. Uh, you know, we're talking about one of the main misconceptions that I heard is just sort of a whether it's scientists, managers, or the broader public, it's difficult to understand nuanced topics uh, that, especially us. You know, scientists who are on this call, like we spend our whole careers thinking about the nuance, and so it seems obvious to us, right? Um, but there's there's a lot of variation in in how wildfire can impact wildlife communities, um, and a lot of variation in how fire can impact other kinds of things that we care about. Um, but there's a there's this term that I've heard a lot more in recent years, or this phrase, "good fire," and I've heard this on podcasts, I've heard it in the news, I've heard it, you know. Um, uh, you know, potentially even the literature, I, I don't remember, but it's certainly a phrase that I hear a lot more and I've used it myself. Um, and so I want to, I want to hear what you guys think, like, what does this, what does good fire mean to you? Um, and what does it look like for wildlife? 
And maybe I want to ask Andrew first, because I saw him give a little smile when I said good fire. So maybe you have some thoughts on it. Well, no, I, I just think about it because I've working in Northern California for a while, I saw a lot of bumper stickers that said good fires prevent bad ones. Maybe you've seen this as well. And so this is something that, I, that I've thought about and I, I don't have um, kind of well formed thoughts to share right now, except that a lot of times when we talk about good fire, when we put one of those qualities on a fire that has happened, of course, that's that's coming from our own interpretation of this. Um, and often that comes from a implicitly assumed historical baseline that we're looking to match. The issue is that we don't often, we, we often have incomplete information about what that baseline is, um, or we're setting an arbitrary baseline that might actually not represent what what that ecosystem's historically adapted to, either because there's nuance, like Zach was saying, across space or across time. And so to me, when we say good fire, we're often trying to elicit a, a fire that represents what we think the fire regime ought to be based on some temporal baseline. Whether or not we're correct about uh, applying that, that quality to the fire is up for a, a, a different sort of debate, I think. Any other panelists want to jump in and talk about good fire? What is it? What does it mean to you? And what is? What do you think good fire is for wildlife? I hate it when people ask that question. You're welcome, Angela. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I, 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 this is where I feel like we can be more helpful, and I agree with you know some of the, and I actually it's hilarious because I have that bumper sticker actually on my door, because I do think it helps. Just I, I don't, I agree with you that it's is it that really that helpful of a message, but is it like punchy enough to get people to understand that not all fire is bad? Like I, I can give it that. Like I think it's punchy enough and simplistic enough that we re really need to start like shaping, shaping that message that all fires are bad. Andrew, you probably also like I get really irritated when people, you know, assume that all high severity fire is bad. It's like, no, <laughs> that is not true. <laughs> um, so I guess, you know, when people pose those questions to me, like if I get a question, you know, I don't. I will never give a yes, because I'm Angela, I'll never give a yes, no answer. You know, I'll ask them to, well, for, for are you thinking wildlife in general? Are you thinking in California? Like just trying to help them understand that that question is very contextual. Well, what do you want? What are you worried about? You know, because I think that those, I think that minute we jump into our elevator speech, we've already done a disfavor, I guess is what I would say. Yeah, we, we as scientists love being able to say it depends, right? <laughs> yeah, um, I don't, yeah, I try not to say it depends too. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's, it's all it's all contextual. Yeah, it's difficult because we want to be able to communicate really clear, um, you know, true information. Um, but oftentimes it's hard to, to give a sound bite that isn't that doesn't smooth over the really important context. Um, I, I totally agree with you, Angela. Uh, Jamie, Zach, or, or Katie, any, any any thoughts on good fire? What does it what does it look like for wildlife? Is there a single definition? Uh, you know, is there something you can say more broadly? Well, I can tell you, um, you know, because I am a scientist and I do research on it, I, I I probably have my own take on good fire, just like the public might be fearful of wildfires that might hurt them or their property. That would be bad fire. Uh, maybe they maybe some public people would think, you know, fuels reduction is good if they're educated enough to know about it. But in my view, good fire would be the kinds of fire that are needed by a particular ecosystem to maintain a particular community of species. And that would vary across the ecosystems. So, but that's because I'm biased and I happen to love natural ecosystems. And you're right, Gavin, we may not necessarily, or Andrew, I think you said that we are in our information on fire regimes is incomplete. You know, we kind of have our own thoughts of how frequent and, you know, but you can kind of tell by how the vegetation and wildlife communities respond to certain fire frequencies that some were probably. And so I'm biased and I, you know, for example, on the coastal plain, I would consider good fire to be frequent 
not terribly intense, you know, high severity, but low, low, lower severity, frequent fires, because it maintains that ecosystem and the wildlife that depend on it in sand hills, for example. So, you know, I think it depends on who you are, what you're going to think is good. I, yeah, that's, I think that's exactly right, Katie. And I just want to highlight a comment that Bryce Hanbury put in the chat, which is that good and bad are assessed relative to human demands and expectations. It's a total value statement, right? Um, so it depends on what we want um, and what good and bad are. Um, so Zach, do you want to follow up on that at all for Jamie? Yeah, I, I guess um, my answer to that would be, I, I tend to be uncomfortable with absolutes and, and pretty much everything, but that goes with this too. So so or extremes if you will so so there's like the bad fires that everybody thinks of these big mega fires that burn huge patches of high severity that's usually not desirable for you know a broad swath of wildlife like it may be, it might be for some species and it's not desirable for a lot of the things that humans uh want out of a landscape and on the other end, end is the absence of fire so bad fire is also no fire um and so if if you know if you want to to give a succinct answer, it's, it's we want a, the heterogeneity of that. We want a variation in fire effects or fire timing. So this idea of higher diversity, and I think that you know obviously that that in of itself is too simplistic, right? Because we talked about it depends on the ecosystem you're in. So I tend to think about these frequent fire forests in California in the West, and it seems like power diversity or variation in fire uh, history seems to be pretty good for those fire regimes. But if you take it in, into another fire regime where it's it's less frequent, that might not be the best. Maybe a, a crown fire is good in, in, in an aspen stand or you know um, lodgepole that hasn't seen fire in 300, 400 years. That might be good. So no, so even the bet hedging with we want kind of want it all for for wildlife or the wildlife community in general. Um, it, it depends on where you are, but but I think that's often safer than you know looking for variation is often better than what we have, whether that's because we've been suppressing fire or we, we pushed it too far in the other direction. So pushing it back to the middle is often safe. And I just want to follow up on that and, and kind of highlight what um, Bryce has, has put in the chat here, talking about how it really depends on the lens through which we view current ecosystem and disturbance norms. And I think one, one broader theme that's emerging from this conversation is what really needs to happen in our fire terminology for good and bad fires is, is replying with the question, good for what? Good for who? Or bad for who? Bad for what? Because a fire that's good for a certain species might be bad for another species, or, or it could be good for a certain forestry outcome or a good uh, a, a certain management target. The same fire could be bad for, for humans or human property. And so I think Kind of putting that context in there and saying, you know, there, there's good and there's bad. There's a spectrum between those things, but there's also a, a context between um, which lens we're we're viewing and assessing that good versus bad. Well, thank you all for that question. Um, and I think Jamie, you're welcome to jump in. I saw you shaking your head. You're you're good there. Um, so I want to go to the the. Uh, our, our callers, uh, we've got Patrick Shea who's raised their hand. Patrick, would you, I'm gonna try to give you permission to talk. Oops, let's see, ask you to unmute. Can you yeah. talk now, Patrick? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, why don't you go ahead and yeah. give, give us your question. Um, I do a lot of hydrology work in Red Butte Canyon next to the University of Utah. And it seems to me one of the important variables in defining good or bad would be a denominator of water. What's the impact on water? Because that's one of the greatest evolutionary pressures uh, that species, be they flora or fauna, uh, will experience. Uh, and that's why the question I asked earlier in the chat, um, it, it does seem to me in the def defining, you, you almost need to look at impact on soil, impact on water, and revegetation or regrowth. Uh, so it's more of a calculus formula than a fraction formula. Thanks. Yeah, I, I really like that, Patrick. Um, these are complex issues. And we, you know, here in this panel and this these past few weeks, we've really been focusing on the wildlife outcome, right? 
Um, but there's a whole range of other conditions or services or values that humans have that are going to differ in terms of their importance for you know uh, different people. So again, water is one service that obviously we all care about. I work in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Water is everything in the Southwest. Um, you know, I'm in I'm in Phoenix right now on vacation with my family, and it's you know, water is everything. Absolutely, I agree. And at the same time, you're going to have other stakeholders who are, you know, most strongly interested in wildlife habitat. You're going to have others that are most strongly interested in timber revenues or timber outputs. They're going to have others that are most interested in soil or, you know, other types of, uh, you know, um, uh, services, you know, carbon storage, um, smoke, you know, output and things like that. So there's, there's all sorts of dimensions to the problem and different sort of um, you know, responses, response variables that different people are interested in. And I think, you know, one, one thing that I would love to see in, you know, future research is, um, you know, a greater emphasis on linking, uh, you know, the impacts of wildfire to multiple, multiple dimensions, you know, of ecosystem services, both the biodiversity side, the water side, the carbon storage side, et cetera, and try and understand how those different pieces that may be emphasized or valued greater or, or, or less by different stakeholders kind of articulate together um, and how our, our interventions may sort of influence each of those across different axes in different ways. Any well, other responses to Patrick's question? Well, I'll just say, Gavin, I agree. I was like, oh, well, we're really kind of just trying to focus on wildlife here, but you know, your response made me think, oh yeah, you're thinking of wildlife as terrestrial wildlife. <laughs> again like um i'm sure you know and I, that's how i think of it too i, I study terrestrial wildlife so I'm, I'm sure it does have a wildlife interface um and there is a huge body of literature on that whether it's you know particularly with fish <laughs> but, um, but with amphibians as well so um i i would say that's a whole other wildlife community that we didn't really talk about here that has its own set of complications. Any other responses to, to Patrick or other thoughts there? Yeah, I think I, I, you know, just to, to layer, layer another um, piece of complexity on there, but thinking about wildlife, um, particularly in these you know, semi-arid arid ecosystems is that you have these interaction, interacting disturbances of, of fire and drought. And oftentimes, you know, they, go together. So if you have a hot, dry year in some places, that's going to be a more fire prone year. And so if you have wildlife communities or species that are, are sensitive to water resources, which most are to some extent, but especially the fish and amphibians, when you have these compounding droughts, that can be perhaps that's, those are the circumstances when you have these tipping points and you have, um, you know, the, the greater threats um, to, to, you know, Extinction on the, on the broad scale, but more extra extirpation on, on a smaller scale. Um, and that's, you know, it's, it's another difficult thing to, to, to disentangle is how those different disturbances um, play together or, or um, compound each other. So that's an interesting topic that needs, needs more research too. All right. Uh, well, thank you, Patrick, for that. Uh, comment and question. Um, I want to ask another question to the panel, a, a new one we haven't touched on much yet, uh, which is what barriers exist to implementing better fire management practices for wildlife conservation? And again, I use the word better, so there's a value uh, statement in there. What does that mean? It might vary depending on who you ask. But basically, what stands in our way to, to improving the situation for wildlife in terms of fire management? And maybe more specifically, you know, do we need better or more and more science? Do we need better policy solutions, better application of policy. What are the main barriers or bottlenecks moving forward uh, to conserving wildlife or, or, you know, improving fire management in this new era? Um, and I want to start by asking Jamie. Jamie, do you have any thoughts you'd like to, to share with us on that? Yeah, so in my mind, one barrier that I think is the time from a research study to getting in the hands of managers. Um, 
one of the barriers is just the time it takes to complete a research study because a lot of times folks on the ground need stuff now and it might not have been done now. So um, anyways, any way that we can reduce that overall time from study to on the ground, I think, and be more efficient, have systems that are, can efficiently produce that full research cycle, I would say. That's great. I hadn't thought about that when I asked that question. Uh, thanks, Jamie. Um, Katie, do you, do you have any thoughts on this? What, what barriers exist to helping us move forward? Um, I think there are physical barriers like land ownership. I mean, there's the obvious ones where, you know, the Forest Service burns here and the state burns there and the private land, you know. Um, there are landscapes that are barriers that, um, you know, there's a lot of humans scattered throughout our landscapes. Um, and there are um, attitude barriers, of course, uh, where the public may or may not want to see fires. Um, uh, and then there's the, uh, the barriers like weather and burn days and smoke policies and all that kind of stuff. So I think there's a lot of barriers, um, but that's, you know, it's all tangled up with, you know, how much should you be burning? Like they're part of the reason in our area, I think that there are so few burn days is because probably Southern Appalachians didn't burn that much in the past unless humans were actually trying to do it, which was rampant, you know, Native Americans and settlers. But, you know, lightning strikes didn't happen that often because our vegetation is so hard to burn most of the time, you know. So um, there's there are climate barriers there, there. And there's a lot of other physical barriers as well as mental barriers. That's a lot of barriers. <laughs> So who, who solves who solves that, Katie? Like like what do you think is the sort of like how do we how do we untangle that mess? Uh, that's not a question that I can really answer. <laughs> Somebody else knows. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I and I don't mean to put you on the spot there with that because I think that's a tough question. But maybe the other panelists can think about that too as they respond. Like how how do we untangle that ball of barriers that different people sort of are in charge of, right? You know, one group may be able to fix their piece, but there's a, that's connected to other pieces. Um, so let's, I wanna throw that question over to uh, uh, Andrew. What what barriers exist to implementing better fire thanks, management for wildlife? And, and, and thanks Katie for that response too. That, that really got me thinking about just how, how much of a barrier different land ownership actually is. I, I hadn't thought about that that much because a lot of my work has been done in the West where we've got large land ownership blocks. Um, to me, the a, a big barrier that, that I think about a lot personally uh, goes back to a, a previous conversation about how there's a lot of nuance in how animals now, terrestrial animals, respond to fire. And a lot of times our understanding of, of that nuance just comes from a, a, a collection of localized studies. So we study spotted owls here, and we study spotted owls there, and then we compare those two responses and we see that they're different. And so understanding that, that nuance across space, how species responses to fire vary across space, because we know that fire regimes also change across space, is a huge challenge. Um, and it's a challenge that is extremely data hungry. In order to have perfect understanding of this, there needs to be a study in every single fire. A, a field a field based study and that's not possible that's extremely data hungry and so I, I like thinking about the solutions to these sorts of problems from a science standpoint and I think there's there's a number of different solutions that are in the works right now I think about um, we've seen more literature out using bioacoustics to study bird responses to fire that gives us the ability to monitor um, this is largely birds of course things that that, that we can hear easily and survey through bioacoustics, but it gives us the ability to monitor across larger areas. I also think about using citizen science data. Um, I'm someone that, that works a lot with data from this big citizen science program called eBird, and that gives us just, just, just unprecedented amounts of information, 
And right now I'm working to see, can we look inside of those giant data sets and get a signal of fire responses and then use that to then understand how those responses change across space and time. And I think um, a third solution is among different field studies that, that work in a more localized setting, I just think increased coordination through things like these webinars or um, symposia at, at meetings and, 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 and things like that, just to kind of coordinate our field studies in more standardized ways so that we can more easily compare across space and time. One thing about field studies though, Jamie and Andrew, uh, a lot of times you, you feel like, you know, it's, we don't, and it is a big problem is getting science into the hands of managers, but also most of the time, I would say a research study here and there does not provide very many answers to the managers. <laughs> I mean, it's a little teeny weeny piece of the puzzle. And it's not like if we just got it out to them, they would change all their management practices or, or, you know, whatever it is. That's how I always feel about my research. My research, this paper talks about this little thing and that paper, you know, the syntheses are good, Gavin. So that's good that you do a lot of that. What are the, the so as a scientist, what are the things that we can do to make our research uh, e the, the most easy to access? So, to like reduce that barrier from science to practice? So Andrew, I'd love to, Pose, I mean, I, I really appreciated Katie's response because I have a very unpopular response to this type of question. <laughs> and I guess I would challenge the scientific community to say, what does it mean to do science? Because I ever, you know, I hear a lot of the science question is all about, well, getting data and publications. And I think, you know, what is our biggest barrier that scientists think that data, you know, that science and research means collecting huge big data streams and just helping people understand where variation is coming from more. And, you know, my first answer was about like, I want to know about where the nuance is to help them understand, like, it's not this or that, but it, that's rarely what I think is holding us back. And then, you know, as we move forward, even like trying to hit historical fire regimes and we're like, well, do we need to go for historical? What does that actually mean if we could recreate historical fire regimes? Like, is that is that really gonna help us? So, I mean, for me, I don't think that the most, the barriers that are holding us back to using more fire in the landscape or seeing more fire in the landscape are really science as we define it related at all. I think the barriers are kind of outside of ecological science, maybe social science, but outside the, the realm of ecological science. And I think the more we keep, you know, carrying on with this, that being a scientist and producing science means that you get bigger and better data with, you know, tighter precision. I, I think, you know, the more we emphasize just that modality of science, it means we're having less conversations that might be able to help people move along and kind of have those nuanced discussions about, well, why does that matter to you? Like, and I think having people stop and have asked that question first and come to agreement, like as a collaboration of what matters to them, um, I think that serves us a lot better than some of the, the, the you know, the way we traditionally think of science as publishing lot, lots of papers. Um, I guess that's my unpopular view of what I think is needed. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to piggyback on that, Angela, a little bit, and then I'll, I want to pose the question to Zach, um, which is, you know, I also have sort of an unpopular opinion here that is sort of an opinion that uh, at first makes my job seem irrelevant because I, <laughs> I, I sort of think that we actually know a lot of what we already need to know. Um, now we don't know everything. And I think there's a lot of, I mean, you know, every every question we answer opens up like 10 other questions that you know we didn't know we had before, right? So there's so much science that can be done and should be done. The stuff that Andrew was describing, for example, the large scale analyses, like those are totally necessary. Um, and I think that it, you know at the same time, we there's a pretty deep literature that exists on fire effects to wildlife um, that is in some aspects and along some facets it's like quite conclusive like we, we kind of know what's going on and we know what to expect um and we have the information available to make decisions but we're not the decision makers as scientists right 
And so I think the uh, there was a comment that was made here earlier, uh, Joseph, and I don't see Joseph's last name right now, Joseph Redden, you know, was talking about attitude barriers and uh, social license. I think a huge barrier, uh, in my mind, the biggest barrier we have is sort of the social license to implement some of the things that science suggests might be beneficial to our various values and, and services. Um, so whether that's wildlife or water or carbon or resilience or whatever, uh, you know, I, the, the literature is pretty solid in, in many of these areas. And the, the question is whether we have the social license or whether we've communicated the work well enough in a way that, um, uh, you know, reduces the social barriers to change. And again, what, what exactly the changes are that are made, I think is outside of the purview of, you know, most scientists. It's, you know, we're here to provide the information. Um, and so either we haven't communicated the information well enough uh, or what I think is more likely is there's a lack of a social license to make some of these changes. Um, and so, you know, I, I will keep on the science side, you know, continuing to try to try and do cool science that I think is going to be useful. But at the same time, I think we, we kind of know what to do in, in a lot of these cases. Um, so I don't know if anyone has a response to that, but I do want to pitch it over to Zach because I want to hear what Zach thinks uh, some of the barriers are. So maybe Zach, if you want to take it away and respond to that and others can jump on. Can, can Zach I? Is, Yep. Sorry, I would love to respond to what you just said, Gavin, because again, yeah. I'm a scientist. I love being a scientist. I don't want to be anything other than a scientist. So I wouldn't argue that what I'm uh, what I was saying was not to do science. Um, and I guess maybe as a, a way of what I'm, you know, an example of what I mean by that, you know, uh, we're undergoing this big initiative where it is, we're going out and we're, you know, monitoring a lot of these big, huge fires that are happening in the West. And we're looking at everything from re regeneration to fuel accumulation, to invasive spread, to, you know, tree mortality, everything we could think about, what we're worried about with our forests is transitioning. We're putting out bat ARUs, bird ARUs, camera traps at these large scales to try to start understanding more because, I think one of the social barriers is that people don't think we understand enough. You know, I think that also falls into one of our social barriers. Um, but I think what's important that we don't do that Jamie kind of, you know, lead, led, you know, was hinting on too, is if what that conveying of that science is waiting until we have a publication that goes out and then puts it out, or then when we're all done with the cycle holding a workshop, then I don't think we're helping each other learn as we go. And I don't think we spend enough time learning as we go um, within our communities. We kind of collect the data or we might have that talk, we collect that data and then we go and we publish it. And then by the time it comes out, you know, with the site, with the lag that Jamie was referring to, I don't know really, we're already on to our next question, our next, next concern. So I, I do think that there's a way of doing science and being a scientist in our traditional sense that doesn't necessarily mean that everything has to be published quickly, but maybe we can all learn as we go together. Managers, the public, like we take more time to communicate that side of it, you know, as opposed to just, you know, which journal are we gonna get it into? Well, I think uh, Angela, sorry, sorry, Zach. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Angela, good, good conversation. The role of scientists isn't to learn as we go. I mean, we obviously we build upon things, but I, I think that the point of having research and scientific studies is that, you know, it is peer reviewed and it is put into scientific journals and therefore it's definitive. It's not adaptive management. Let's try this and let me learn something here. It's, it's you know, it's supposed to be a little bit more authoritative. It's certainly not comprehensive. Like I said, every little thing is one tiny piece to the puzzle, but it's supposed to be authoritative. So I think it would compromise the idea of what science is if we're just kind of, you know, exchanging daily information with people as if it's scientific authority, which it isn't until it's close to being published. Yeah, and I wanna, I'm, gonna, I'm also gonna interrupt you, Zach. So <laughs> I'm not, I'm not talking, go for it. <laughs> but but I, I, wanna, I wanna just highlight a couple of things in the chat. You know, first Corey Davis, who's hosting here, um, you know, mentioned the Joint Fire Science Ex Exchange Program. So this is a great program uh, that helps shorten that transfer time of science to, to managers. So, you know, just a plug, I guess, to check out that, uh, that service or that, that organization. And then also Allison Dean commented that 
Uh, you know, they think one of the best solutions for the science delivery barrier is webinars like these. <laughs> so, um, and there's a, a bit of a longer comment there. Um, so go ahead and, and read that. But uh, thank you, Allison, for that comment. And I'm glad this is something that might be one piece of the puzzle. So uh, Zach, or sorry, <laughs> Jamie, go ahead. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'll just jump in here. So one thing that I've adopted with a lot of my projects is the idea of co-creation. So um, working with managers at all steps of the process, helping co-develop questions and um, thinking about what the end products will be at the start of the project. So it's not just, okay, let's work in silos and see what happens at the end. It's let's develop things along the way together. Thank you. Yeah, and when part of that being sharing what you learned along the way and couching it such that this is not what, you know, as a, I mean, we all give presentations that haven't necessarily gone through peer review. I mean, I totally hear what you're saying, Katie, that that is it, but we share information all the time. We're excited to share information maybe even before it gets to the finish line. Like, I don't think it, I'm not worried that it's going to make me less of a science or someone's going to, you know, God, we publish papers that then have to be recalled because there was an error in them. So yeah. I, I'm, I, I understand, I do agree that we have to, you know, make sure that people understand like what, and I think that's part of it too. I think if managers can understand what we're up against, that's part of the communication process that's important to have with managers, not, not this daily part but it does take a really long time and it's expected to be this this and this but just having that conversation along the way co-developing the research as we go like truly in a co-developed fashion i think is more what i'm talking about as opposed to you know daily conversations per se yeah, i don't i don't want to hear from zach i'm just doing my best so that zach doesn't get a speech <laughs> You all are assuming I have something to say. I'm just, I'm just hanging out here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, we'll talk now. Yeah. Thanks for that. Thanks for that discussion. Yeah, Zach. So what, what barriers exist in your mind to implementing better fire management for wildlife? Uh, yeah. So I, I think for that original question, um, I think one of the big barriers to, to add to, to Katie's original list was that managing for wildlife is maybe fourth priority. Usually, I mean, in terms of fire management, I mean, first we're, we're managing to not burn down homes, you know, maybe then we're, we're, we're managing for uh, uh, ecosystem services like um, like water um, provisioning, especially in, in dry, dry um, parts of the, of the country, especially the, like the southwest. Um, and then, you know, now carbon, keeping carbon on the landscape is a big priority. And then maybe we get to wildlife at that point. So I think that. Um, one of the challenges is that uh, for managing for wildlife, we need to link it to some of those other priorities and say, okay, under what management scenarios do we have complementarity with some of these other resources that we're trying to, to, to maintain and what, what areas do, are there trade-offs? So if we are doing a fuels reduction, um, is that's probably supporting some wildlife, some bonus of the community, which, which are those and which are the ones that, that are lacking? And if we can we can identify that that disparity, then maybe we can start to plan for uh, more targeted um, management for, with wildlife included in that. But I think oftentimes it's you know we do all these studies and then we present it. We, even if we're co-producing with managers, that might all get steamrolled because you know they need to do some thinning in the wooey or something like that, and that may not necessarily be designed for wildlife. Great. Well, thank you everyone for answering those questions. And uh, I think we're going to wrap up here in just a couple of minutes because we're getting close to the top of the hour. Um, and I want to respect everybody's time. So maybe I'll, we'll end by uh, popcorning around. And if anyone wants to communicate here, one of, one of two things or both, I will keep it brief. So maybe I'll tell you, you know, 30 seconds or less. Um, no, number one, like, if you could design a study to answer some of the questions that we still have, what would it be? Um, and you can just be brief. And or if you don't answer that question, like what is something you want the those who are calling in and listening to to take home from today? So maybe we'll start with Zach and go backwards. We talked a lot about how how things 
you know, vary across fire regimes and ecosystems and, and taxa. And, and I think, you know, if money were not, not a, a limitation, if we could work with everybody, all the experts and the managers across these ecosystems doing a kind of consistent uh, comparative study. So we go out and we, we monitor all the, all these, uh, these species across the range of, of fire uh, effects. We do that in California. We do that in the Southeast U S we do that in Australia. And so we can start to tease apart some of these, some of these nuances about what types of fire are good, right? Uh, back to that question about good fire um, and do that in a consistent way. And, and Angela probably doesn't like this answer because it's, it's a big data answer. Um, but I think it would be, uh, it, it would allow us to kind of uh, uh, deal with a lot of the, the complications and nuances that we have when we, we pull together these different independent studies. And, and I think that would be, uh, be pretty cool pretty useful that sounds like one of those like globally distributed experiments like nutrient net or things like that where you kind of have little studies everywhere right that's that that are all very consistent that's, that's a cool idea zach um jamie what, what about you uh, either a, a study idea or something you want people to remember so i would have to say i was going to say the same thing that zach said <laughs> that we need to start working together fully to get the longer scales, whether it be temporal and spatial, and start putting holistic um, ideas together. And underpinning that is that consistent monitoring framework for all the wildlife species that we're looking at. So but here's a plug for, for good monitoring. Great, thank you. Uh, Andrew. Well, I, I really liked those kind of design a study questions. And, and so I'll, I'll try to think of something from the more communication side. What, what is an important take home here? And I think as a scientist uh, in this group, I think one thing that I just want to encourage those listening is, is to, to you know, find names in this group or find names of scientists that have published papers that you're interested in and reach out. Um, and communicate the, the research needs from a management standpoint. I think one thing that I struggle with sometimes is I, I, I definitely like to do my science in, in kind of a, sometimes instead of a hypothesis-driven framework, it's in a needs-based framework. Where is there a science need and how can we fill that need with science? And I think one of the barriers that I experience is that sometimes I have a really poor understanding of what those needs are. <laughs> um, and, and that's on me, but I think that, that uh, better lines of communication between the people that are implementing decisions on the ground, making the decisions, and people that have the ability to design studies, fund studies, and, and conduct this work, I think that's a really important connection to make. And that's why I'm really happy that, that groups like this and webinars like this can happen. Thanks, Andrew. So Katie and, and Angela, we've just got like a minute left. So Katie, you wanna jump in here? Okay, I, I like Zach and, and Jamie's ideas of having a huge study that in every single ecosystem that's well replicated and addresses every single thing we would ever want to know over the long term. <laughs> but um, I also think another thing that's very interesting would be, why do you want to burn? What are the results you're looking for? And are there, are there other things you can do to get those results? Like Andrew and I have talked about this before that a lot of times shelter wood harvest could get the same result as a high severity burn for breeding birds in the Southern Appalachians. Let me get specific here. So, I mean, are there other things that you can do um, to get the results that you want or is fire something magical in itself that can, can't, you can't get the results any other way, so. No, thanks Katie. Angela, you wanna give you like 10 seconds. Sure. Well, the study that Zach and Jamie were talking about that is would be ideal, I would say, is one that PSW and PNW are doing right now. Um, so I would argue that that study is being done. And if it's something that you want to do more in Rocky Mountain, I'd be um, more than happy to share that with you. But it's, you know, we've got several large fires going on where we're implementing the same study design, looking across all 
ecosystem response to be set as a long-term study where we're going immediately after these fires across fire severity gradients and trying to understand not just what wildlife communities are there across those ecosystems, whether it's the understory, overstory, fuels, invasives, but how that changes over time with and without management action. So I would say that I agree that would be a good study. <laughs> um, I would be happy to show you what PNW and PSW have come up with to kind of start addressing that question. Great, all right, so stay posted. So I just wanna say thank you to the panelists. Thank you to all the attendees and I'm gonna turn it over to Corey to close us out. Yeah, thanks. This has been a great discussion. Uh, I particularly like the discussion obviously about transfer of science uh, to managers. And I, I think Andrew was getting at this and I saw some comments in the chat as well about you know that it really needs to be a two-way conversation that the manager's needs need to be made uh, clear to the scientists. And so again, uh, we're trying to do that as well, but always open to new ideas um, that of, of ways that we can do that better. So uh, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us at the Fire Sirens Exchange Program. And someone did ask uh, if your emails would be available somewhere. Um, if it's okay with you guys, I will post those on our uh, on the event webpage uh, for this. So there will be a past event webpage uh, on our website that will have the links to the recordings and the uh, also the documents, the articles that they were talking about. So I'll put the emails up there as well. All right. So thanks everyone for uh, taking part in this. Uh, this series has been wonderful. And uh, yeah, hopefully uh, we can do more of this going forward. All right. Thanks again. Thanks everybody. Thank you.